welcome to Data Byte 159, um, doing the work, therapeutic labor, teletherapy, and the platformization of mental health care. Uh, I'm Livia Garofalo, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a researcher on the Trustworthy Infrastructures team at Data and Society and author of the report. So I will be your host uh, today with support from Wei Wang, research analyst on this project and assistant producer Tunika Onifikami and senior producer Rigoberto Lara from our events team. For those joining Data and Society events for the first time, welcome. Um, we are happy that you're here. Uh, data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. This year, DNS turns 10, and I'm excited to be celebrating the anniversary with this event. You can learn more about we've, what we've accomplished and where we're headed on our website, datadsociety.net, and uh, how to participate. So we're gonna have a discussion, but during the discussion, we'll use the chat feature to post links and ask you to share your experiences. Uh, to ask or upvote questions for us, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we've set time um, to address questions, so please, please um, participate. But before um, we start our discussion to get, um, today with our wonderful guests, I just wanted to give sort of the context for this conversation. Um, the format of, of our discussion today is a Zoom call, and it reflects how many therapists are connecting with their clients. Many of you here might have been in a therapy session that looks somewhat like this um, from the waist up in these Zoom boxes um, from your own home, hopefully though with fewer people on the call. You might also have been uh, have seen advertisements for a variety of platforms that offer to connect you with a therapist, sometimes promising 24-7 availability and instant matching with one. And teletherapy and platform therapy have undoubtedly become new ways for people to access therapy and mental health care. But what about the providers? And this is what we're here to talk about today. Therapists um, have had to adjust their practice to not only a new medium, this virtual uh, world that we're all inhabiting now, but also adapt to new ways of how their labor is structured, especially if working for therapy platforms that are now a very large player in the mental health field. So how are these providers on the other sides of these screens, keyboards, and platforms providing these services? How do they do the work? And how is this changing what therapy is? What alternative models exist? So in this discussion, we'll think about how technology is changing how, therapies, how therapists do their work, what the consequences are for the present and future of therapeutic labor and for therapy itself. And I'm thrilled to be joined in conversation um, by three wonderful guests, uh, Linda Michaels, Mei Kwong, and Melody Lee. Um, Linda, Michaels uh, is a psychologist with a private practice in Chicago. She is chair and co-founder of the Psychotherapy Action Network, SIAM, and has published, presented, and been interviewed on the value of psychotherapy, therapeutic relationship, and technology in the public narrative about therapy. Welcome, Linda. Good to um, see you. Mei Kwong is currently um, the executive director for the Center for Connected Health Policy, the federal designated national telehealth policy resource center is recognized as an expert on telehealth policy and has been consulted by state and federal lawmakers on telehealth legislation and policy. Mel Lee is the founder of Inclusive Therapists, a liberation-oriented mental health director, directory resource hub and community centering intersectionality, marginalized identity, their activism focused on decolon decolonizing mental health and mobilizing for collective liberation. So welcome, welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, so I'm just going to have a have you all introduce yourselves and uh, briefly, uh, and how really have you come to encounter mental health care and teletherapy, um, and sort of your trajectory uh, in the approaching of this world. Um, uh, Linda, do you want to start first? Sure. Thanks so much. Um, so great to be here, and your report and your research were really so fantastic, Livia. I encourage everyone to to read it thoroughly. Um, yeah, as, as you said, I, I am, but wear two hats. I'm in private practice myself as a clinician, and then I'm also the 
co-founder and chair of Psychotherapy Action Network, which is an advocacy organization, a nonprofit, um, where we identify and try to stand up for and protect uh, quality therapy. And so we're very concerned about questions that um, of technology and how that impacts our work. Um, you know, I, I know we'll get into a lot of details today with this great panel. Um, and I really think about, you know, the, how is the technology both facilitated the traditional therapy that we were, um, many of us were doing pre-pandemic? How did that make it safe for us to continue the work during the pandemic um, and not leave our clients stranded? And then what are some of the ways that different kinds of technology are attempting to disrupt or, or reorganize our work and fundamentally change it and change the incentives involved. And so I think we'll, maybe I'll stop here because I know we're gonna get into a lot of that, but um, yeah, thinking about all of that going forward. Wonderful. Uh, May, do you wanna introduce yourself and give us uh, answer sort of some of those questions on how you come to this problem? Sure, and thank you for having me here today and congratulations to Data and Society on your 10 year anniversary. That's definitely like something to celebrate and a great milestone to achieve. Um, as Livia said, my name is May Kwong. I am with the Center for Connected Health Policy. For those who are not familiar with it, uh, CCHP receives federal funding to provide technical assistance on telehealth policy. Originally intended just to help the other telehealth resource centers who are underneath the same funding stream with their telehealth policy questions. Um, however, our mandate from for the funding was kind of broad and vague, so we just basically just opened it up to the world and said, like, well, if anybody has a questions around telehealth policy, please feel free to contact us. So we um, field questions from everybody from the White House to Congress to state legislators. Um, health plans, health systems, hospitals, clinics. And when the pandemic hit, more frequently, we were seeing questions coming in from patients. But we've always, always really engaged with a lot of providers because you know, they've had questions around telehealth policy, such as, you know, what services are covered and how I can get reimbursed. So I've been doing this for over 10 years in telehealth policy. So we've I've seen personally what the telehealth landscape looked like before COVID mm -hmm. and during COVID and now in a post public health emergency environment. And there's definitely been a change in the landscape and the environment and particularly for mental and behavioral health. Um, mental and behavioral health and telehealth have always been something that's been around, but definitely the pandemic provided that tipping point to launch it into this new sort of changing, ever changing environment. And as far as like, you know, my specialty on that is to track those policies on how that influences the environment. So I'm really excited to be here today. I've had a chance to interact with Linda and Melody, and I know we're gonna be in for a great conversation here. Thank you, May. Uh, Melody, do you wanna introduce yourself and also tell us a little bit about inclusive therapists? Um... Thank you, Olivia. Hi everyone, such a pleasure to be with you here. I'm Melody Lee and just wanna acknowledge my positionality in relationship to this land. I am a settler here on Turtle Island um, and um, I am currently located on the land of the Multnomah people, Clackamas peoples and other tribes and nations that have stewarded this land for generations. And um, as such, uh, I advocate for land back returning land and life to indigenous peoples, indigenous sovereignty, also black liberation as forefront and foundation to the work that we do at, in, at inclusive therapists, but also extensions of that in the work we do in community and in um, our practices. And so when we, um, when Olivia mentioned like decolonizing mental health care as a core part of what we do, um, for us, that means resisting and dismantling colonial capitalism from mental health care and examining ways that our field is complicit to carceral systems, colonialism and oppressive practices that disproportionately impact people with marginalized identities. So in the conversation today about this connection with tech and how um, you know, tech capitalism 
um, connects with now our field. Um, this discussion, I will continue to center people with marginalized identities, clinicians and clients. Um, and I look forward to this conversation with you all. Thank you, Melody, for that. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that we're having um, this discussion across so many different perspectives. We, when we talk about therapy, I mean, that's a very all encompassing word, right? As, when we, you know, using the word therapy and using the word platforms um, is, are these very large words that, you know, mean very different things to very different, for different people, for clients and providers, and especially um, for people who are approaching therapy for the first time, especially since the pandemic. Um, who might only have approached, who might only know therapy in this virtual, virtual uh, world. Um, so I just want to start um, by asking sort of how really the move to this medium has changed how providers are doing their work and really acknowledging as Melody, you were saying, the diversity of providers in this field, right? And, and sort of the research and the report um, that, I, that I did, I spoke with 50 people uh, from different credentials, orientations across the country uh, who have incredibly diverse perspectives, but also are witnessing some common trends in their profession. Um, so I was wondering if you, if we could talk about how has Teletherapy as the medium, the virtual medium, um, before we go into the sort of platform stuff, changed uh, the field of mental health care, both for Melody and then to how you've practiced, how you've connected with your clients, patients. Um, and um, for May, sort of really the talking about some of the challenges of regulation, given that a lot of, you know, every provider is um, a licensed in a specific state, right? or license in multiple states. So I just wanted to kind of have this conversation about the teletherapy, the medium and the challenges of this before we go into the platform stuff and the tech capitalism, which is very, very much part of this conversation and was part of this report. Um, anyone wanna take a, a stab first? Um, Linda, do you wanna go ahead? Sure, sure. I can <laughs> say that, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the technology and the, the screens that what we're using now here today is, has really um, been uh, very important to helping us get through the pandemic and again, being able to continue to offer care to folks during the pandemic when many other professions had to stop. Um, you know, it offered a, a physical safety for us to continue that care. And in some cases, some more access and flexibility um, sometimes I've also seen it help some patients, I, I use the term patients generally, uh, with more emotional safety, not just physical safety. It enabled certain folks to be more open um, when they were especially discussing some really vulnerable or shameful topics. And that was um, a, has been a very interesting development for some of them. But I think we really have to also be mindful of a few important things that um, working and communicating and relating over screens is, is not the same as being in person. Um, there may be some gains, but there are a lot of losses and some that are really even hard to understand. I mean, like none of us here today is actually making eye contact with one another. Um, it feels like we are, but, but we're not. Um, and so how does you know, that affect uh, communication and intimacy. Um, how can we really best build and maintain and prioritize the relationship between the therapist and, and the patient when there is this mediating screen and we're not really connecting in the same ways that we would in person? And what does it mean to have this illusion of intimacy within the context of an intimate relationship? Um, I certainly don't have all the answers to these questions, but I, I think, you know, they're definitely worth thinking about because it is altering the ways in which we work and, and relate. Um, and now I'm seeing actually a lot of people first off uh, requesting to come in and meet in person to start new therapies in person, um, which, 
we've also done some of our own market research and, and that's corroborated there as well. Um, but I think ultimately the clinician and the patient need to work together to figure out, you know, what is best for them and, and why, um, and to be able to make those choices together. Yeah, I want to jump on like Linda's last statement there of like, it's between the patient and the provider to decide what's the best way in which the patient should be receiving their services. Um, I think if you talk to any telehealth proponent, they'll say, you know, it's not going to be for everybody. It's not, the technology is there to be used as a tool, but it's not going to be appropriate for every single situation and every single patient. You can have two different patients that on paper, maybe they you know, quote unquote, look the same of like, you know, of treatment, but telehealth is going to work for one and telehealth is not going to work for the other. As far as like the regulatory landscape, the, especially during the pandemic, the regulatory landscape and the policy landscape basically opened channels for telehealth to be used more widely. Before it was pretty restrictive um, as far as, you know, what services you can provide, the, the licensure laws and other types of policies in place as well there. So the pandemic opened up those channels a little bit more in order to basically, you know, make it more available to a wider, wider scope of folks. Um, however, like now that we're in a post PHE environment, we either are in like, well, some of those channels are open temporarily or they've closed depending on like, you know, what you're looking at specifically. Um, but what's been interesting is, is that there's this increased interest from policymakers on definitely on keeping telehealth available as a tool for mental and behavioral health um, as a way to, to provide the services to patients. But I would say also in the US, like the policymakers are mindful of like some of these these sort of guardrails that they think need to be in place. Um, Linda mentioned, you know, patients wanting to to come into the office and have an in-person visit, which is always a patient's choice. The patient should always know that they can request that they do not have to have their services via telehealth. And you start seeing like certain policies put into place uh, where the policymaker may require that at least there's, you know, at least once a year check-in in person with the patient. So you are seeing some of the policymakers, both on the federal and state, state level, taking that into consideration and like having some of those policies um, laid out there. I think, May, this really, uh, and I want to get to Melody and what your perspective is on this, because we're, we're seeing, and this emerged in a lot of the conversations with the providers, right? This is a, a technically a dyadic relationship, right? Um, but there's all these other entities that are in the room, right? Insurance is in the room. Some yeah. of the, many of the providers that I spoke with had a lot of frustrations around reimbursement and compensation rates. And we can speak about that later, but I think what's, what's really interesting in this conversation, having the three of you here is how there's many more, more entities in the room than just even even when there's it feels like it's very intimate right maybe you're facetiming with your therapist but all these other structures are present and as you know and not only when it comes to the telehealth regulatory landscape there's you know other structures of oppression outside the the therapeutic relationship right that can't yeah. be ignored and, um, and just to add and, and sorry livia and melody but just to add one thing and it's extremely hard for the mm. or the practitioner to navigate to absolutely it's, like, it's just so difficult for them absolutely um yes definitely uh melody do you want to jump in sure thanks for the lead in so appreciating you naming structures in the therapeutic space and to that um you know the complexities that's involved when now um, corporations and you know tech platforms are um, also in the room. And um, another one I want to name is the carceral system, which I can expand on more as well, and the involvement, the connection between the mental health field and carceral systems and how that, um, and what is tech's role in that uh, when it comes to things like mandated reporting, policing, um, things like that. So I can expand on that more and coming into like, just reflecting on my experience, um, of shifting to, to tele, telehealth. I remember I was on my laptop in my room, my bedroom, um, some, you know, meeting with folks, I call them participants or service users that might be 
literally in the closet um, and uh, or in their cars or just trying to find space. Um, and that speaks to the necessity of care. And over time, what we started to observe is that access to care is not equal for everyone, right? So on one hand, there's the reduction of barrier to care in many forms. For example, um, you know, if a person lives in a rural area, now they may have access to more options um, of, of who to see. Uh, for folks that might find it intimidating to enter, physically enter into a, a therapy space, this might feel like a warm lead up um, to, to then decide what they, you know, they want that collaborative relationship to look like. Um, and other re reduction of um, barriers could be um, time. It saves us time, it could be convenient, we can just pop on, we can do it on our phone. Um, but what we do see is that the disparities have become highlighted. For example, access to care requires private space, which is different for everyone. Access to technology and devices, and also um, to even internet connection. Um, not having the assumption that everybody has secure and reliable connection. And so these are some of the barriers that we started to notice. And it's essential to always come back to um, how is this impacting people that have been um, systemically marginalized. Um, but when it comes to the, the you know, <clears throat> practice, from a clinician's perspective, um, there is now, you know, with tech spaces, there's a reliance on talk therapy. Um, you're only seeing this much of me. <laughs> there's a lot going on here that you can't see down here. I cannot see what's happening down there. And so um, the limitations to things like, you know, energy, you know, healing in healing spaces, energy, bodies, movement, nature. When we say we're holding space, how, does, how is that different when we say we're holding space in a physical setting and an online setting? And what I'm really impressed by, though, is just our adaptability um, and creativity. Um, now we're able to have group therapy with folks from all over the place that may not be able to come to a physical space together. And how, um, and so I love conversations with that with community. My concern sometimes is when there are structures that try to monitor police or dictate how that should be done without maybe the um, being as informed as people with the lived experience or those that are actually in the practice or those that are receiving care, that becomes concerning. And I'm glad for this conversation. Uh, Melody, every, so many things that you said um, and also Linda and and May resonated with the, the providers that I spoke to. On one hand, this is incredibly, this has allowed people who would have never walked into my office in a million years to come and get care. And at the same time, the also um, kind of the ethical lines of providers, right? This, this person now has moved to a different state. Can I still see them, right? Can I still provide care? Am I still in the regulatory you know, is it still okay for me to see them? And so I feel like that's a lot of these sort of mental tabs providers had to keep open and are still very much in a, in a bind sometimes about that. Um, and so maybe we can shift to some of the, um, all right, so we've, we've talked about positives and, and challenges, you know, sort of challenges of this. But the other entity and big player in this field now is not only, you know, people switching their private practice to Zoom, which many providers have done, but it's also the entrance of large platforms. Um, and in the in the reports, are, there's many, many, many different kinds of platforms. There's like direct consumer platforms that sort of rely on a um, kind of marketing directly to users. There's platforms that go through employers, and then there's sort of private practice private practice tool platforms that are sort of slightly different. But I was wondering if we could sort of think through how this increased platformization has changed um, the field, both for you as providers, um, but also from a regulatory standpoint, May. 
So I'll, I'll jump in on the regulatory standpoint. Um, and also for the audience who have not figured out, I am the non-clinician on this panel here. So I cannot s listen to Linda and Melody about that. So I'm just talking about the, the regulation. And currently the telehealth policy landscape, where you actually have like existing policy on the books and laws and statute really deal with like Medicare and Medicaid. So, so talking about like another factor that comes into this, those are like very regulated like entities and programs and things. So they, they're probably a lot more sort of safety net and guardrails there when you operate in a Medicaid or Medicare landscape than you would have like, you know, a direct consumer space perhaps. So it, at least in that space, in that Medicare and Medicaid space, you are seeing some of those, you call them protections for the providers um, regarding these platforms. So you're, we're starting to see policies crop up where you know states that have commercial um, payer laws that impact telehealth and how health plans are supposed to treat, treat those will put into law things like, well, you must let your in-network providers be eligible to provide those telehealth services. You cannot rely solely on a third party um, telehealth organization. Or they say like, you cannot force a provider to choose a particular platform in which to utilize and provide those services. So in like that Medicare, Medicaid space, you kind of are seeing more of these policies there that do offer some protection for the provider and also the patients as well too, you know, because not, you know, forcing them off in their health plan to like a third party provider, who they didn't have informed a relationship with, they can go with like their in-network provider and use telehealth. So that's been like kind of the interesting thing of like seeing like, you know, people who are receiving their services through like these government programs, such as Medicare and Medicaid, possibly being a little bit more protected than if you say direct to consumer. Now, not to say direct to consumer, there are no protections there. And, and I've been looking at the chat, there have been questions around licensure and so forth. So there, there are those other regulations out there, but it's just been very interesting to see like, you know, the development on the public payer types of things and on some of the commercial payers with like state laws that say that, you know, you need to, you, you can't like force, you know, a provider to a certain platform or you can't just have like a, telehealth only type of company to meet this requirement that we're asking health plans to meet. Thanks, that's really that's really helpful. And I think it speaks to the the landscape of a, a you know a lot of opaque kind of um, differences between sort of the, the mushroom of these platforms and this is not to like bash all platforms, but they are a player that have emerged so strongly and also make <clears throat> and again, this is a different conversation for for potential users or people approaching therapy. This is sort of talking about how these platforms, why would a provider want to go on a platform, right? Um, and maybe Melody and Linda, you can speak on why, what are the existing challenges in the profession that would prompt someone to be like, yes, I'm going to sign up for this because the admin load is too much. I can, you know, there there's certain advantages that are presented to providers. Um, but uh, yeah, wonder if we can speak to how this feels like to providers, uh, sort of the increased platformization of this landscape. Thank you. I'll just jump on, and um, I really appreciate like learning from Linda as well. Linda has done a great deal of work around it, like confidentiality and things like that. I'll just start off with um, asking us like, what are the incentives? for therapists to join these platforms. And firstly, what is, what is the, you know, if I take a step back, what is the goal? What is the intent of these platforms? What are they trying to gain? And is that in alignment with folks that are joining? And so with these platforms, um, I mean, it's pretty clear it's money, right? These platforms wouldn't exist if they're not making money. Many clinicians enter into this field, yes, to make a living, but also their intent is not solely focused on capitalism. And so there already exists, the, the conflict already exists. Um, the intention is different. And so when we um, put these um, folks um, together, like examples of major tech platforms, right? Talkspace, BetterHelp, et cetera. I think there's a list of them also in the report. Um, if the intention is different, then I'll have to examine 
what is the incentive, what is the draw for clinicians and therapists to, to participate in these platforms. And what we learn, right, when, um, when corporations prioritize profit over people, then there's a dehumanization that happens. Dehumanization in terms of treating um, providers and clients as products um, where they can extract things like data, extract things like information, um, and that poses confidentiality concerns, of course, but also it can become a numbers game. It's about getting as many people onto these platforms as possible, as many clinicians onto these platforms as possible without considering the wellness of the folks in here, the experience, why people are joining. And we do know, um, and that's in the report as well, that um, there is exploitation of clinicians that are on these platforms that may think, okay, this, um, especially for younger uh, clinicians, people with marginalized identities, um, folks that might be newer to the field might think, okay, this could be an easier entry for me, um, but that they may be monetarily exploited or um, that they are not receiving the support that they're needing um, that they might in other spaces like group practices or even in private practice and community um, that really helps us sustain the work that we do. And so we have kind of an Uber model, for example, right? And we're trying to extract services from people um, and increase a person's workload um, without replenishing. Um, then there's high burnout, of course, fatigue, and then like blur of boundaries and so forth. And so those are connected concerns. And I think for me, the big one is always like, what other incentive is there besides money? which is data, right? Data equals money. What is happening to this data that we're giving folks? Uh, sorry, we're giving these corporations. What are they doing with it? And Linda can speak more on this because she has been an advocate in this space about, you know, there have been, um, you know, lawsuits, uh, class action uh, lawsuits against platforms like um, BetterHelp. There are reports about um, how data is mismanaged um, in a lot of these uh, platforms and who is overseeing this because we as clinicians have um, ethical standards we're uh, that we are responsible for there are board licensure regulations but who is regulating these platforms and what is happening to our data and most private private intimate information thanks thanks Millie that's that's great before we move to Linda again because uh, I'm seeing some questions pop up in the chat. When I, and this is in the report, when we say platforms, right, there's a whole variety and sort of, I don't know, menu, right, of how different platform models work um, that allow, you know, some of them allow clinicians to have more an independent practice model, usually the direct to consumer model, which is what we were talking about now, right, the Uberization, the kind of gig like plug and play is the one in the in the experience of the providers that I interviewed, the one where providers feel feel felt really their work being compressed and intensified and having to work many hours. Um, so yeah, if you have more questions about this, just because I was like reading the webinar chat, please put that in the in the Q and A. Uh, but Linda, I'll let you uh, I'll let you go. Thanks, Livia. And yeah, thanks, Melody, for citing so many of these concerns. Um, you know, I think we're at a moment, I mean, it's not just about the technology, that's just sort of the tool or the medium. It's really what we're talking about is the first time we're confronting the entry of big money and private equity and investors um, and a corporate mindset. Um, coming into the mental health space and bringing their incentives, their values, and their orientation into the work that we're doing. And we're seeing so many, unfortunately, so many, too many examples of these tech companies really playing fast and loose with the core tenets of therapy, of privacy, of confidentiality, of being truthful and reliable and as opposed to misleading customers 
into handing over confidential information and then selling it to Facebook, um, for example. Um, you know, ultimately, there is not the respect for clients or for therapists or for therapy. Um, we have, again, a lot of examples. I mean, I will just even mention Talkspace is, you know, we see they were one of the therapist matching uh, platforms that um, started off big, and now they're actually failing in the consumer space. Um, they're not able to make it work. And they are moving now into the business to business space. They're moving into doing contracts with large entities like big employers, insurance plans, governments. Um, in a recent story, they signed a large deal with the city of New York, the government of New York City um, to provide texting products to teens who live in New York. Talkspace said right off the bat, we don't have enough therapists who are trained in doing child and adolescent therapy. Um, many people would stop right there and say, whoa, this is a problem. But Talkspace was unconcerned. They said, oh, we'll train therapists on how to do child and adolescent therapy. Um, so what does that mean? I mean, to Melody's questions of ethics and licensing and credentials, when we have a corporation saying it will train therapists in how to do therapy with the specialized and vulnerable population, you know, what does that even mean? Um, and they're selling a version of access that is made possible by the technology, like 24 seven texting. The technology can do that. So they're selling that as a feature. Uh, being able to change your therapist at the drop of a hat or, or the swipe of a screen. Well, the technology can easily do that. So they're selling that as a feature. It turns out, you know, that is plainly untherapeutic. Um, and those are the kinds of situations that the patient and therapist should talk through together if there's a rupture um, or miscommunication. There shouldn't be a ghosting that happens. That should be the point at which a lot of good work could, could actually get done. Um, it turns out that the public is not really interested in these features so much either. Um, but again, it's just what the technology can afford. I do want to say something about the other kind, Olivia, you mentioned the different kinds of platforms that you researched. And this other kind of platform that's very popular with therapists now is this sort of administrative middleman type of platform like a Headway or an Alma that makes it very simple to do burdensome and complicated administrative tasks for therapists like signing up with insurance plans, billing, things like that. And they're free for therapists, which is kind of, you know, you always have to wonder when something is free, what does it really cost you? Um, so, but yes, these services are all free for therapists and a lot of therapists find them very convenient, understandably so. Um, but therapists should know that insurance companies are part owners of these systems. Are therapists aware of this? Are they gonna be okay working for insurance companies? What happens when an insurance company becomes a full owner of one of these, these platforms? Um, you know, private equity is already coming in and buying up large mental health group practices as they've done in many other medical specialties before reaching our field. And essentially Alma and Headway are large group practices. Um, you know, the, we've seen over and over again, the private equity playbook as they come in. And as we're talking about, their goal is to maximize profitability by either, you know, they reduce what they pay to therapists, um, they intensify the therapist's workload, they centralize administrative tasks, um, which is not always helpful. And they really call the shots on, on how the work should be done. So I think there are a lot of um, uh, beware red flags here that um, not only do consumers need to be as, as well informed as they can be, um, but I think therapists really need to be uh, better informed about all these different tools that are out there and not just say, oh, this is like more convenient for me. It's wow. And it's free. Okay. Um, 
but what are you really giving up? What is that? Um, what does that trade look like? Wow, thank May you. May I jump yeah. in for a second? Yeah, yeah, because I'm fired up now. And <laughs> something that is so standard and basic to our care is something called informed consent. To all clinicians in this space, we know what informed consent is. And our practice requires this to be a dialogue between us and the participants in therapy. And that means if a participant doesn't understand certain parts of the informed consent, they can ask questions, we have dialogue, we may even collaborate and say, okay, we may we need to adjust this um, to accommodate their um, clinicians or um, clients' needs. And what is what does consent can you know informed consent look at in these spaces when there are just pages and pages and pages and terms and conditions that we can bypass by clicking and we have all done that myself included and so linda you bring up a really good point that actually the responsibility um the onus shouldn't be on the client the onus should be on the clinicians to say can we seriously honestly say we have read through these um terms and conditions and privacy policies before we checked and to participate because the, because the responsibility is on us. And so if our clients ask us, hey, what is the privacy policy? What, who, who is this platform connected to? Can we honestly say that we can answer that? And if not, what are we doing there? Yeah, that's a, that's a great um, point because, and it really highlights the nest like education for both both parties in this right and the big big um, huge shifts that have happened so fast and the pandemic right also provided this as may you're saying like before regulations before the pandemic right it seems it was like an accelerator like oh actually we can do telehealth it's something that we should be doing um but you know how fast that has happened and how sort of these areas of murkiness have allowed to kind of um be part of, of this space. So I see a lot of questions in the chat, so I want to get to those. Uh, but I wonder, uh, while you're, a yeah, while you're looking at it, just really quickly to tag on to a couple of things Linda and Melody have said, at least, you're right, this is definitely an accelerator. And we also have to understand policymakers are also still trying to work through some of this as well themselves. So it's going to take a little bit of a while. Um, I would say like the pandemic accelerated telehealth policy by a decade that's how quickly it like pushed it forward. So, so policymakers still themselves are trying to work through this and catch up, but it's kind of interesting. A couple of things that Melody and Linda brought up, they are working on them. Like for the privacy and the protection of data, there's been like a lot of notices from um, OCR about like, we are, we are dinging some of these companies for how they are like protecting their data, what they're using it for, for marketing. And I warn providers all the time. It's like, Look into your platforms, look, understand what they are doing with your data. You have to investigate that. So I say that to providers all the time. That's part of my talks. I said, I, I have not seen these regulatory agencies every couple of months. They keep issuing a warning. So they're looking at that. So, you know, protect, be aware and protect yourself. And then the corporatization of, um, you know, private equity and the investment into these companies. There are some states that are looking into that now, just in general for healthcare as well too. Oregon has a bill. Um, I don't think it's signed yet, but I think it's like passed through the legislature and California has something touching upon that as well too. So you are seeing policymakers like, you know, slowly ramping up and looking into these spaces as well, but definitely, definitely providers and the consumers, you need to educate yourself and be aware of that. And I know that can be kind of hard because it's difficult landscape to navigate and, and if you're impatient and if you're in a certain situation like that's the last thing you want to like read is like those terms and conditions it's like you know the last thing at the forefront of your mind but it, it's definitely something i also encourage um the consumer and also the providers educate yourself on this it's complicated linda you said be wary of anything that's offered for free CCHP does offer technical assistance for free, so we are here to like there are exceptions. Help you ask, yeah, and help you answer those questions. We're not going to ask you for money. Now, if you ask us to do a big old research project for you, we'll probably say like, well, then we need to sit down and talk. But if you're a consumer, or your provider, and you guys have questions, we will try to answer those for you, and we won't charge you. <laughs> I think this is really. I think this is really important to really. I mean, so much of what I heard from providers is 
these changes are happening. I just want to have a say in how it happens, right? It, and that's why, you know, as Paul, as, and I'm glad to hear that some of these changes and bills are being written, there needs to be input from the providers who are, have been long for years now invested and in, in this process, but also have had to deal with the cognitive dissonance of like, how do I do the work in my session and provide healing and treatment and be ethical about it? And how do I deal with the other, <clears throat> all the other aspects of this, of this profession? Um, yeah, I'm talking providers you need to get involved because I'm a policy person and I'm a JD. I can write like the perfect policy, but if it does not work in practice for the provider and the patient, it's useless. So definitely, you know, provide your insights in like how this actually works. Yeah, I, I would definitely echo May what you're saying to get involved, become aware that's a lot of the consciousness raising we're trying to do at Psychotherapy Action Network, for example, and I know Melody does as well. Um, but, you know, a lot of these tech companies that we're talking about, um, they are run by software developers and business people. Um, they do not have clinicians at the helm. And so, you know, I, it is concerning. I mean, technology is here to stay. The screens are here to stay. AI is coming. It's here to stay. But the technology cannot be done to us. We need to be part of this dialogue and these decisions and this conversation. And right now, I don't think we are um, sufficiently. They are creating the products. They're marketing them. They're selling them. And we're involved in an ancillary way, um, as Melody was saying, as, as kind of the, the data or the helping them execute. But we are not involved at the highest levels in developing what is actually a therapeutic way to help people at a distance at scale we're not involved in those decisions and we need to be my last question was going to be about the future <clears throat> the future of therapy um, um but there's so many uh, questions in the chat I feel like everybody's very fired up about um about this so let's see if we can take one platform i see one comment about um, how platforms have helped some of the destigmatization, right? Um, and stigma reduction and increasing, increasing access and sort of that, and that's sort of in this conversation, even doing this research, I was also concerned about not having this conversation being a deterrent to access services, right? Even ethically as a researcher doing this work. Um, so that's, that's just something that I wanted to, wanted to put out there. Um, Let's see, sorry, there's so, there's so many. I guess one, one question is about, um, one population uh, that I see in this question is about children and teens um, as a population that has, the many of the, many of the um, providers that I worked with had a very hard time switching their therapy sessions with children and teens and sort of how that is a very different regulatory also, I mean, you're dealing with minors, uh, but also how to do that with um, in the therapeutic relationship. So I don't know if uh, Linda or Melody, you have thoughts about about that as I peruse all these questions <laughs> that have popped. Um, I'll jump in in connection to um, other comments that I saw in the chat about um, about specialized care. And so that includes children and teens. And so what happens and, and May commented on this earlier about how um, teletherapy is not for everyone. So I'm thinking about like play therapy. I'm thinking about like walk and talk therapy and so forth. And like, you know, the, and somebody else also commented something that I'm very passionate about is which is um, the reclamation of all the healing practices that are not according to Western psychology models, right? That are not so-called evidence-based until it has been co-opted by this field and resold back, repackaged and resold back to us. And um, different communities have different needs. And on one hand, we can say, well, then maybe teletherapy is just not for those communities that we're not able to provide those forms of care. 
but the, we also have to look um, generations down the line. If this continues to be the case and these forms of healing that we know are helpful to our communities um, are now um, not considered legitimate and hasn't been considered legitimate for so long, but even more so right through regulations, through insurance, um, what happens to, then to um, uh, ability to be trained ability to learn about these forms of training um, and there is going to be a ripple effect and and so uh, these are going to be necessary confirmation uh, conversations that we have as a field of how do we integrate all forms of care that we know are helpful how does that shift in the digital space and being mindful that um, these corporations don't have a say in what is legitimate and what is not um, but also what is the fluidity between tech spaces and also in-person spaces and also in connection with nature, spirit, um, and other forms of care as well. Um, but they should not be the ones dictating. Absolutely. And yeah, I'm just scanning the chat as well. And um, there's some comments about cost and the insurance industry and, um, you know, a lot of these platform models that we're talking about today operate outside of that field. They're subscription models. Um, the cost goes directly to the consumer. They're not reimbursed by insurance. And that is an, an additional burden um, on the user. Um, and it also, I, I also hope that when we think about these um, these tech products that they don't distract us from some really huge fundamental systemic problems in the field, such as insurance company abuses, such as lack of parity, even though it's the law of the land. Um, we do not have that. Um, there is a lot more out of network usage for therapy, um, for example, and there's um, people say there aren't enough therapists. Well, there's even fewer PCPs um, but there's a much uh, greater in-network usage of PCPs than therapists. So um, therapists are not paid enough by insurance companies. That's the bottom line. And, you know, there's, Livia, you documented, you know, really nicely all the ways in which therapists are, are not fairly compensated by a lot of these platforms. And I really worry that, you know, that trend is, is going to continue um, so I, I just also want to point that out. There were some comments about cost and equity, and um, it's a huge problem in the field, um, even including and in, in outside of the question of the technology platforms. Yeah, for sure. Cost and, and making a living, right, Melody? You're saying people don't go into being a therapist for money, but um, there's also a level of uh, precarity that is now kind of um, affecting providers in the field. And it, it has to do with, with making a living and earning an income and sort of how much even individual sessions are compensated uh, by some of these platforms. So there's a lot, I think one of the things that maybe the public um, or even people who are in therapy don't realize is how much the therapist, the provider has to keep in mind outside of the individual session and sort of this was the the goal of really this project was to understand this as a form of, of therapeutic labor right as other kinds of labor that have um you know issues of inequity issues of professional experience and professional ethics and professional identity um may do you have anything um to add before maybe the last question maybe we can wrap up where we have about seven minutes left on some of the future and some of the things that can be done <laughs> and alternative alternative models perhaps but may do you have something to say that relates to this previous comment that linda and melody were making no i mean just just that I'm just going to echo what I said in the beginning is that telehealth is not like a one size fits all. And it's not going to be, you know, something that will be able and work for everybody. I mean, Melody pointed out that there are a lot of different therapies right now that either they haven't figured out how to use technology to provide them or maybe are, are, are not, um, 
you know, appropriate to use technology to provide them, but they should not be, you know, a patient should not be cut off from like that avenue of like having that therapy be what they need um, for their particular, their condition there. Um, it's just that, you know, but to get to your, your next sort of question of like, what is coming down the pipeline and what's the changing landscape, at least on the policy end, um, a lot of states, and, and really it's kind of been more interesting on the federal level, they've been a little bit more stuck on things, N not around the privacy. They've actually been really like kind of a little bit more diligent about that. So it's really been interesting to see what the states are doing on the state level of, um, they were the ones that I talked about a little a moment ago about like, you know, trying to address some of those corporate practices or like that private equity money going into to healthcare and like different practices and so forth. Um, but they've also been, um, you know, the ones that are shaping like the Medicaid program and putting those requirements of like, you know, the person must have like be able to provide in-person services as well too to patients and not exclusively use telehealth. So on, on the federal level, they, I don't know if folks are familiar with this, if they follow telehealth, the policy they may be, we've been on a temporary like waiver with some of like the telehealth relaxations and it looks like they're going to extend that for an additional two years. So that's why I said like they've been kind of like, you know, it kind of stuck on like where they are and what they're going forward with as far as like the coverage in Medicare is concerned. Um, and we didn't even talk about prescribing. That's like also something that like comes into to another tool that the therapist needs like within their toolbox as well for, for patients as well. So it's really kind of, we may see the states kind of advancing a little bit more or going a little bit further around some of the questions that we talked about today. So I would say like over the next two years, because the feds seem to be in this holding pattern, probably states might start outstripping what the federal government is doing in this area. Thank you. Let's see. Yeah, let's uh, Melody or Linda. Uh, how, how can we make lives for uh, for providers and users both? Um, you know, how can we change things um, while maintaining important mental health care access that is so crucial to folks? Since we only have three minutes of time, the question I want to leave with participants here today is who should hold the power? Who is currently holding the power? And who should hold the power? Now we have tech that's also holding power in, in addition to corporations, in addition to insurance, of course, the government. What if the power shifted back to the people? Don't we want universal mental health care? We see that in other places and we aren't having to rely on these corporate models and, and these oppressive structures to receive care. And one trend that I have been already noticing is for, especially for younger generations, they are already not trusting these platforms. They're saying, we want to reclaim our healing and our work outside of the gaze of these, um, of these structures and of these um, you know, capitalist and oppressive structures. I'm thinking of the student activists right now. They are not going on these platforms to talk to therapists because they do not know, they do not have assurance that their data is gonna be kept safe. They don't know if they're gonna have the police knocking on their doors. So how do we return power to the people is what I wanna leave with us to think about today. Yeah, I would also, you know, I, I definitely agree. And I would also like us to approach these questions of technology and the structure of our work. You know, um, again, the, these platforms, these questions are not gonna go away the technology is going to keep advancing. And I would like us to, you know, not get in a, a splitting position and say, oh, this is bad, this is good, um, or deny what technology can potentially offer. Um, and, you know, but rather to be how we are with our patients, to be open and curious and see what we can learn. Um, but we really need to be, uh, driving these conversations about what is therapy? What is healing? What is the slippery slope when it turns into a self-help tool or something other than a real therapeutic relationship? I mean, we have a lot to say about that and we really need to be offering that evidence base and that valuable information because the people, um, as we're talking about now, the, the money at the top of these companies, they don't know the answers to these questions and we do. 
I wish we could stay on for so much longer. There's a question I, that, that was just asked about TikTok therapy. We didn't even go into like therapy, therapeutic content on, you know, social media, which is a whole other, whole other world. But I think the richness of this conversation really is a testament to um, your your contributions as speakers coming from very different perspectives, but also how we really need to have continued um, continued continued discussions about this that include therapists, clients, and just you know every everybody who um, is interested in this in this um, in this issue. So thank you. Please join me in thanking today's panelists, Linda Michaels, Mei Kwong, and Melanie Lee. I really want to extend my gratitude to all the therapists who participated in this research and some of them might be here. Um, and also another thank you to Sui Wang, research analyst on this project and to everyone at DNS. And thank you all for joining this conversation today. Um, please keep in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you.